Okay, we may uh, we may cut the song. I am not skilled to understand. Starting in a minute, guys.
<clears throat> okay. I think we're ready to uh, we're ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. It's time for our half past ten morning worship service. Uh, so we're going to begin now. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's great to connect with you. And if this is only your first or second time joining with us, then a very warm welcome to you. And I hope that you find this service to be a helpful encouragement for your faith. Now I've got a bit of a cough this morning, uh, so I'm relying on my family and you at home to do a lot of the singing this morning. Uh, but please forgive me if I cough while I'm speaking. Uh, remember, if you want to learn more about Welshpool Community Church, what we believe and do as a church, uh, then please do get in touch and our contact details are on our Facebook page. We'd be happy to talk with you about the gospel and the things that we believe as a church. Okay, well we've joined together to worship God, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to be encouraged as we seek to follow him. So let's pray and ask for God's blessing upon us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Although we are in different places, even different countries, we unite at your throne and worship a God who offers peace and hope to people of all nations. So Lord, we pray that you would inspire and encourage our faith this morning as we seek to proclaim the greatness of our God and of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read Psalm 100 to you before we sing, just a short psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. We're instructed to come into his presence with singing. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to sing. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ, he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poured. poured. And then the chorus, to the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, you are the God who saves. Let's sing this together.
Amen. Okay. Let's put that out of the way. In a minute, I'm going to give a short children's talk. Uh, and then we're going to sing a children's song. Uh, but before that, I just want to remind you that we'll be having communion later in the service this morning, uh, today. So that's a time when we use bread and today we've got grape juice uh, to help us remember the death of Christ for us. Usually it's something that we have when we're actually all together as a church. But as that isn't possible at the moment, we're having this remembrance in our own homes, but at the same time. Communion is for people who believe Jesus died for their sins. People for whom those symbols of bread and wine have genuine meaning. And if that's you, then I encourage you to get something ready for later in the service, even if it's just a biscuit or a cracker and some water. But if you don't believe Jesus died for your sins, or you're just not comfortable taking communion in this way, then later on simply spend those few minutes in prayer or reading your Bible. So that will be towards the end of the service today. Uh, but right now I'm going to uh, give a short children's talk. So I'll move this out of the way over there. Just take that with me. And uh, sit down. I'm just going to wait hopefully for my friend to appear. I'm going to speak from the Bible in a minute, so I'm just going to find the right passage, John chapter 6, there we go. And we're going to sing a song first. Let's put that over the way, over the way there. And I'm just wondering if, if my friend is going to appear. Is he coming today? Can you see him? Is he? Hey, there he is. Hello, it's Donovan. The Friendly Local Lion. Hello, Donovan, how are you? How have you been this week? Have you had to stay at home this week? Yeah, so have we. Well, it's good to see you, Donovan. Uh, we're going to be reading from the Bible today. Do you know what's, do you remember what's special about the Bible? That's right. God says hello through the Bible. He tells us about himself and he tells us about his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a song about that. <laughs> And uh, you know what, someone, I think my wife might be coming to help us with the actions. Oh, yes, she is. <laughs> yes, thank you. There we go. If you can find a space there. So this is to help us with the actions. Now, next week, we're going to add a little bit more to this song and make it extra super cool. But we're just going to practice the actions, especially this week. So here we go. We're going to sing the song. The first bit. You ready? says hello through the Bible. God says hello through the Bible. God says hello and all we need to know. God says hello through the Bible. And remember this next bit, when I point at you, you have to say your name very loudly. You ready? Here we go. He says hello to Donovan and hello to Ruth. He says hello to whoa, whoa. that was loud through the Bible. God says hello through the Bible. God says hello through the Bible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't she good? Yes. Say yes, Donovan. Yes, Donovan. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking now, let me get this out of the way, about something that happens in the life of Jesus. We read about it in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Jesus is with his disciples, and he sees a large crowd of people following him. Thousands and thousands of people. And they don't have anything to eat. Oh. So he says to his disciples, find some food. But all they can find is some bread loaves, because they had bread flour back then, 
and some little fish. This boy had got these five loaves and a couple of fish and that was it. Not even enough really for, for, for 50 people, let alone thousands of people. But Jesus gave thanks for the food and he just told his disciples, start sharing out the food. And you know what? Every time they thought the food was going to run out, there was more food to keep giving. And they kept giving more and more food. Until all those thousands of people were full. And then they gathered up all the leftover food. And there was more than when they'd started. Jesus had performed an amazing miracle, Donovan. He had shared that food with everybody so that they were all well fed. He'd shown again that he was God's son. With God's power, with a heart full of God's love, and he'd come to carry out God's plan to free people from their sins and give them eternal life in heaven forever. Well, we also read a little time later, Jesus was with his disciples, and a group of people came to him and they, they were like, Oh, Jesus, can you give us another sign? And Jesus said, You're not here for a sign. You're here because you've had bread and you want more food. But you shouldn't labour for food that's not going to keep you alive for very long. And then Jesus said, said this in John 6, verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus said, I'm like bread that can make you live forever. Well, how do we receive Jesus like this bread? Well, he actually tells us a few verses later. Listen to this. He says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if we believe in Jesus, if we trust our lives to Jesus, he can give us eternal life in heaven. Well, should we pray, Donovan, and ask God to help us believe in Jesus? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we can read in the Bible that Jesus is your son, who did amazing things. But most amazing of all is that he can give us life that lasts forever. Help us to believe in Jesus and trust our lives to him. Amen. 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 Thank you, Donovan. Thanks for your help. See you next Sunday. Brilliant. Say bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, Donovan. Give me five. Oh, oh, sharp claws, Donovan. Right, off you go. We're going to sing a children's song now. A song that reminds us of something Jesus said. The song is, For God so loved the world, He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, shall not die, but have eternal life. So we're going to sing the first bit, and the second bit, and then finish on the first bit again.
guitar out of the way. Okay. Well, I'm going to lead us in prayer now. And as I've done previous Sundays, there'll be a couple of points in my prayer where, having prayed for something in a general way, I'll then pause for a minute or so and allow you time at home to pray for specific individuals and situations that you're aware of. And as usual, I encourage you to pray aloud, even if you're on your own. Okay, so let's, let's pray. Our great and mighty God, we're grateful that we're able to join together in this act of worship. Lord, we pray that you would encourage us today. Give us an assurance of your presence in our lives and of your steadfast love. We praise you for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We praise you for that amazing plan of salvation. Help each one of us today to exercise our faith in Christ, to trust him as our saviour and to follow him as our Lord. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's fruit in our lives. Even while so many things seem to be on pause, we pray that your work in us would continue, that we would continue to develop as your children, growing in love and peace, in joy and gentleness. We thank you for the promise that you will see through to completion the work that you've begun in us. And we look forward to that final day when Christ will return and take his people to be with him in glory forever. May that promised day give us comfort and renew our hope now. Lord, we pray for our elected officials and for those in positions of authority. Help them to make wise decisions as they seek to allocate resources to battle this pandemic and bless their efforts. We thank you for the freedom we have to share in a service like this and we pray that you would protect that freedom. We pray, Lord, for those who live in places where online worship services are banned. Please comfort your persecuted people and strengthen their faith. Lord, we're increasingly conscious of the restrictions that stop us from meeting together, but we thank you for the continued love that we have for one another, a fruit of your love for us. And we take a minute now, Father, to pray for the people of our own church families and for other local churches and churches that we know. Lord, we thank you for the tokens of your grace that we experience, for our health and for our daily needs being met. We pray for those who are providing emergency services, for NHS staff and other frontline care providers. We ask that you would bless the work of voluntary organisations that are helping those who are particularly vulnerable. Lord, we pray now for our families and neighbours and for those we know who are especially in need.
We're so grateful, Lord, that we can come to your throne in prayer and find grace that is sufficient for every need. We bring all of our petitions and thanksgiving to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to uh, we're going to sing a song now. Uh, before we do that, we're going to read. We're going to read from God's Word. We're going to read the passage that I'll be teaching from, uh, from First John, chapter four. First John, chapter four. going to read from verse 7 uh, to the end of the chapter. And the words will be on the screen. 1 John 4 from verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We're going to look at a particular verse from that in a few minutes. We're going to sing a song. Uh, here we go. And this song is uh, like a prayer, really, before we come to God's Word. Prepare our hearts, O God. Help us to receive. Break the hard and stony ground. Help our unbelief. Show us Christ. Okay, here we go.
of this uh, streaming service, working out the best place for me to stand. Is that fine? Yeah. Move over. I'm told to move over this way. Let me just grab my water. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, that's good. And so I'm going to teach now from God's Word, and then uh, afterwards I'm going to lead us in a time of communion as we remember, remember the Lord's death. Okay, great. Well, we're going to be looking particularly at 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, where we read, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you're wondering what a propitiation is, don't panic. We'll get to it a bit later. Uh, we've reached the second part of a short series looking at the life, death, resurrection and ascension to heaven of Jesus Christ. Last week we considered his life and recognised that Jesus lived a sinless life so that he could die carrying the sins of other people and cover those people with his own sinless life. He is able to reconcile us to God by covering us in that luxurious robe of righteousness. Well, this week we're focusing on his death and on what John is telling us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. So as I did last week, I'll make a statement and then I'll break that statement up into smaller chunks and go through it. So the statement is this. Jesus came to die on a cross so that God's anger could be absorbed and God's love could be outpoured. Okay, so let's go through that. Firstly, Jesus came to die on a cross. John tells us in verse 10 that God sent his son. And he sent him with a purpose. Remember, Jesus was sinless. Everything he did pleased God. And we read in Philippians 2 verse 8 that Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
The crucifixion of Jesus was part of God's plan and had been since the beginning of history. Jesus himself teaches us this. After his resurrection, he meets with a couple of his followers and they're confused about the crucifixion. But listen to Jesus' response in Luke 24, verse 25 to 27. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's the very first books of the Old Testament, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We find Jesus does the same again later when he meets more of his followers gathered together in a room. In Luke 24, verse 44, we read, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Jesus shows them that his journey to the cross was traced out over thousands of years of Old Testament history. When God rescues his people in the Old Testament, we're being shown elements of the rescue that Jesus would carry out. For example, like David defeating Goliath, Jesus would defeat the great enemy of God's people, the devil. Like Moses leading God's people out of slavery in Egypt, Jesus would give God's people freedom from slavery to sin. Like the ark, Jesus would provide us with a shelter from God's judgment. God had planned Christ's death from the very beginning, and Jesus submitted to the plan willingly. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, John is able to write that Jesus laid down his life for us. Jesus himself says in the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus said he had the authority to lay down his life. No one could take it from him. When Jesus died on the cross, it was God's plan and it was Jesus' choice. The Father and the Son were in complete harmony. But why did Jesus choose to die on the cross? Why did God send his Son to die in that way? Well, Jesus came to die on a cross so that God's anger could be absorbed. It might seem strange to talk about God's anger when looking at this passage from 1 John. When we read it earlier, probably the word that stood out to you was love. In fact, between verse 7 and 21, the word love appears almost 30 times. But what we'll discover is that the importance John gives to love and his confidence in God's love are based on his understanding of God's anger. The Bible teaches us that God is angry about sin. And if we're honest, we'll admit that his anger is justified. Think about what makes you justifiably angry. You'll probably feel it when you watch the news and you hear about a group of people being treated unfairly or a part of the planet that is being exploited. And you feel anger because of that injustice. And the more you care about those people or that place, the more anger you'll feel. You'll feel the hurt of those being hurt if you care passionately about people and the planet. But God doesn't watch the news. He doesn't just see the things that make the headlines. 
he sees it all. He sees everything, everywhere, all the time. That's what makes him God. He sees everything, everywhere, all the time. He sees every little injustice that you and I are responsible for. He hears every harsh word that you and I allow to slip out. He notices every selfish motive that has driven you and I. He sees all the pain and suffering that we all cause to each other in big and little ways and the harm we all cause to this world in big and little ways. But more than that, he sees every good thing that we don't bother doing, that we decide is too costly or just not important enough. He sees all the suffering and sorrow that is caused by our inaction. If God really loves the people and the world that he has made, he would have to be angry. He would have to be angry over all the hurt that we cause each other and all the harm we cause to this world. If he wasn't angry, you'd have to question whether he cared at all. And the very first Christians understood this. When the first Christian churches begin to form in the book of Acts, what do we find? Love. They get what John means when he writes here in chapter 4 verse 12, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We find the first churches are more like families, where people share everything and go out of their way to make sure that everyone is cared for. They believed in God's love, but they also believed in God's anger, God's wrath. Jesus himself taught his followers about this in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. He said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So in those letters to the first churches that we have in the New Testament, we read about the wrath, the anger of God, that has been reserved for people. Paul gives this warning, for example, in Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. In Colossians 3, verse 6, Paul writes that the wrath of God is coming. God is holding back his anger over sin, over the way we've treated him, each other, and the world he's made. And that means we're all in trouble, because none of us are without guilt. God is angry, not in spite of his love, but because of his love. Because he cares so much for the people and the planet that he has made. The only hope we have is for God to be so loving, he finds a way to rescue us from his justified anger. That's what this verse is about in 1 John 4. This verse is about how God rescues us from his anger. And that's why John begins with the words, In this is love. How does God rescue us? He provides someone to face his anger in our place. He sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. So what is a propitiation? <clears throat> it's something that redirects anger towards itself and away from something else. Something that redirects anger towards itself and away from something else. Let me give you, uh, tell, me, tell you about an event in my childhood as an illustration. I remember playing at school one day when I was about seven or eight years old. At the edge of the playground, uh, there was a, a strip of gravel 
uh, with some bushes and shrubs in it. Uh, then a low railing fence. And that then went out onto the pavement outside and the road beyond, where cars would be parked. I was feeling bored during this break time, so I picked up a piece of gravel and I threw it over the fence. And it bounced along the bonnet of a car parked on the road. Thinking this was fun, I threw another stone and watched that one bounce across the bonnet again. Then I threw another couple of stones. Well, at that moment, three things happened simultaneously. Firstly, uh, my friend Stuart walked over to see what I was doing. Secondly, a woman got out of the car I'd been throwing stones at. And thirdly, I ran. Well, as I ran, I looked back and I saw my friend Stuart standing where I had been standing. And there was a woman shouting at him across the fence, unleashing her anger on him because her car might have been damaged and threatening to report him to the headmaster. She really let rip at him. At that moment, Stuart became a propitiation for my wrongdoing. He was facing the anger I should have faced. He was facing the wrath that was meant for me. He was being a propitiation for the wrong I had done. What Stuart did unwittingly for me, Jesus did knowingly for me. What my school friend faced on a playground, my saviour faced on a cosmic scale as he absorbed the anger of a God who had seen everything. On the cross, Jesus became a propitiation for all my sins. He redirected God's anger over my sins onto himself so that I could instead have peace with God. Christ becomes the propitiation for my sins by faith. When I put my trust in him. In Romans chapter 3 verse 25 we're told that God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood meaning by his death, to be received by faith. And why would God send his son to face that? Why would Jesus choose to face that? Well, Jesus came to die on a cross so that God's anger could be absorbed and God's love could be outpoured. In chapter 4, verse 9, John tells us, that in this the love of God was made known among us. In verse 10 he uses a similar phrase stating that in this is love. And in verse 11 we read that Jesus died because God so loved us. It's only when we recognise how great God's anger must be over our sin and the harm that it's caused that we can begin to understand how great his love for us must be, that he would not only seek to rescue us, but do so even at the cost of his son. John's confidence in God's love, and the importance he then gives to the church being loving, begins with his acceptance that God must be angry over our sin. But because God's love is so immense, he planned a way to punish sin and still show mercy. A way to put sin to death without putting us to death. A way that would reveal his love to the world. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 8 that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So when I trust Jesus as my Saviour and my Lord, I understand by faith that God loves me because he gave his son for me. My confidence in God's love will therefore not be based on my future performance, but because of something that has already happened. The irreversible death of Christ for me. 
The love that is poured out at the cross never runs dry. If you haven't yet experienced God's love because you've not yet trusted Jesus as your saviour, your rescuer, I encourage you to do so today. We live during days when we're all becoming more aware that our time on earth is not unlimited. Trust in Jesus Christ today. Receive him as the saviour who died in your place for your sins and enter into peaceful fellowship with God and become confident of his love for you. So Jesus came to die on a cross so that God's anger could be absorbed and God's love could be outpoured. But in closing, what impact should that have on my life now? Firstly, I'll stand against sin, but alongside sinners. I won't be able to treat sin lightly because I know how much suffering it caused to Jesus. So I'll stand against sin, but at the same time, I'll remember it was my sin that Jesus suffered for. And so I can't think of myself as being better than other people. Instead, I will begin to esteem others as better than myself. Therefore, while I stand against sin, I'll be able to stand alongside sinners and determine to show them the same love that Jesus showed to me while I was still a lost sinner. Secondly, I'll love other Christians, even if they don't come to my church. An emphasis in John's letter is the community that forms around the cross. His response to the death of Christ is, in chapter 3, verse 16, that he lay down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Inspired by the love of God, he then says in chapter 4, verse 11, we also ought to love one another. We should strive to love and serve each other within a church, but it shouldn't stop there. I'm not called to love only members of my own church, but all those for whom Christ has become a propitiation. Thirdly and finally, when I remember the Lord's death, I'll feel sorrow and joy. In a few minutes, we'll be remembering the Lord's death, using the symbols of bread and grape juice. These are only symbols, but they have a profound meaning as they remind us of what Christ went through and what he gave up to rescue us from our sins and to give us peace with God. As we eat and drink, our aim is to remember both the gravity and the glory of the cross. We should feel sorrow because of the blood that was shed, but we should also feel joy because of the love that is still being poured out today. As we share these symbols, we joyfully remember that we share in a new covenant, a new promise of God's love, demonstrated through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was willing to give his life to carry our sins on the cross, to face your justified anger over our sin. We thank you, Father, that he is a sufficient sacrifice. We thank you that we can find peace with God through him. Help each one of us this morning to trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to move cross to the side and then we're just going to take a moment to get the bread and grape juice ready uh, as we remember the Lord's death. I'm going to be reading a short passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So you may find it helpful to have a Bible open at that, uh, at that chapter. Give you a moment at home to get uh, get things ready as well.
And uh, we're going to do as we often uh, do in Welshville Community Church. Uh, we're going to give thanks for the bread first and then share that and eat it. Uh, and then we're going to give thanks for the blood of Christ shed for us. And then we're going to share some cups out. Uh, but we're not going to drink as soon as we get our cups. We're going to wait and we're going to drink all at the same time. So I'd encourage you to do that as well. So we're going to have communion, the Lord's Supper, in remembrance of the death of Jesus Christ. We have some red grape juice and some bread, which we're going to share here. And if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your saviour and believe that he died for your sins, then I invite you to join in this remembrance at home at the same time as us. I'll now read some of the instructions given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I'm going to give thanks and then we'll share the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the death of Christ for us. We thank you, Father, that he was willing to suffer so much and to die in order to rescue us from our sins. Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of life that we have in him. And we thank you, Father, through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, well, I'm going to break this bread, and, uh, and then my wife Ruth is just going to take it from me. She's going to share it with some of the members of my family. So if you're doing this at home, just share out what you have and eat in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to continue reading from that passage in 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks again before we share the cups. Lord, we thank you for this new covenant, this new promise of your love that we discover at the cross. We thank you, Father, that we can trust and be confident in your love because Christ died for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the assurance we now have in Christ that one day we will all join together as your people, celebrating the wedding feast of the Lamb. We thank you, Father. For our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, uh, we're just going to take, take one of these. Ruth, do you want to share those around? Okay. So we're just passing the cups around. Once everybody's got their cup, we'll then drink together at the same time. A reminder that we share together in the blessings of Christ's death for us. Well, let's drink together then and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Well, we're going to sing to bring our service to a close. A hymn that reminds us 
of the faithfulness of Christ. We can rely on him completely as our saviour. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. In the chorus, for my Saviour loves me so, he will hold me fast. Let's sing this together. Thessalonians chapter 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. 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 Thank you again for joining us this morning. That brings our live stream to an end. Uh, we'll update our Facebook page and our website with information about next Sunday's service, if anything is different about the time. But we should be here again next Sunday at half past ten. So thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day. <laughs>